We're continuing this series on the patriarchal dispensation, and uh, this is lesson eight, and I got two or three more planned. I'm not sure when I'll finish. But uh, what we're seeing is that as far as law, as far as principles of right and wrong, the, uh, the Bible has timeless principles, and a number of principles are timeless. And when we learn what's right under the patriarchal, vast majority of the time it's right under the Mosaic dispensation for the Jews and right for us as well. And what was wrong under these, these two laws or systems was wrong for us. There are some differences, however, and we'll get into those a little bit later. But we want to lay it out a little more clearly. So this is all relevant to us, even though it was for their law, because it's ours too. It's a timeless principle. We have two basic ideas or concepts that are very critical for us. We have to have a godly attitude, and we have to be righteous. So ungodliness and unrighteousness are both sinful. Now, ungodliness is not putting things in the right perspective that God placed them. And uh, so it's dealing with things in, a, in an improper way, the wrong attitude. Whereas unrighteousness is actions that are wrong. So we see here both ungodliness and unrighteousness are wrong. In Romans 1, 18, we saw that last week. Many sins that the Gentiles committed while they were under the patriarchal law can be classified as ungodliness and also as unrighteousness. Some are because of attitude ungodliness and some because of their actions are unrighteous. Now, we looked at unrighteousness a little bit last week, and we defined it, basically the golden rule sets it forth. Because what we find is that a righteous attitude treats all people by the same standards, including myself. I don't, I don't uh, justify myself uh, when I would condemn you for the same act. That would be unrighteous. So I'm, I'm going to abide by the same standard for everybody. And when we don't apply the same standard, we're unrighteous. Now, we, we see right here in Romans 1.30, and we'll lay all these out and see how they are either unrighteous or they're ungodly. And backbiters is one of these things that we see here. Now, a backbiter is uh, from a Greek word which means to speak down or... We just use the expression in English, you put people down. Putting people down is backbiting. That's what it means. Uh, Thayer says it's a defamer. When you defame someone, you put them down. What is my purpose when I say something about someone? Is it to build them up, to raise them up, to make them better, or to put them down? Do I, do I feel better because I put you down? <laughs> And now I don't have to elevate myself. I believe uh, that might be part of the problem sometimes. We want to put other people down, and we don't want to elevate ourselves by, by actually doing better and thinking better and conducting ourselves in a better way. So backbiters are unrighteous. Why? Well, because I don't want to be put down by you, but I'll put you down. If, I, if I'm that way, I'm, I'm a backbiter and I'm unrighteous. So that's what backbiting is. Now, Thayer says it's an evil speaker, but it, it's not defined. But a defamer is. I defame them. I'm trying to take their fame and lower it. Lower their, their, uh, their uh, as people see them. Lower them in the view of other people. Uh Moulton, Harold Moulton's lexicon of the Greek New Testament, says it's slanderous, a detractor. So I detract from them. I have to find something wrong, even if it's picky, picky, picky. I have to find something wrong. And so whenever I'm that way, I'm a backbiter. Now, you know, whenever I was younger, I heard preachers say backbiting is sinful. And I know, never heard anybody lay it out for us very simply. I always thought, I remember seeing, we had this, my, my father had, a, had some donkeys, and he would use them for, for 
breeding mules, to get horses to get mules. And so what we had is this donkey, their mean, a jack donkey's mean, a male, and he got after my horse, and I was about seven years old, and I had a horse. It was an old horse. It was about 20, 22 years old, and he couldn't buck very hard or anything. He was real gentle, but he was my horse, and I got to ride him. Well, this jack took after him and uh, had him down and was killing him. And so I just I just thought of that. And of course, they bite him on the back of the neck and bite him. And I just, that's my view of backbiting. Well, that's kind of what it is. It's not, not really wrong to think of it that way. But that's how I viewed backbiting when I saw this, this donkey. And he would fight and go after the horse, the older horse. Well, whenever we're back, backbiting people, we are doing it to put them down. And that's what animals do. Well, so it's sinful because I'm unrighteous. I don't want you to do that to me. I don't want you to say things that put me down, that cause people to think less of me. Why should I do it to you? Well, if I, I'm not willing to do it to have it done to myself, then I shouldn't do it to you. The golden rule comes to play here, as we laid out last week. So backbiting is a very serious matter. And I think we can get into it if we're not careful. We've got to put somebody down. Got to put them down. Hateful to God. Now, this may be more un ungodly, but hateful to God will probably be some action as well. Exceptionally impious or wicked. So a person who, who is hateful to God might be doing things that he doesn't want done to him, but it probably this would be ungodliness because it's a wrong attitude toward God. God has a place, and we have our place, and we need to know our place, and we need to know God's place. God is the creator, and uh, we should utterly, totally respect God, totally. But... Right here, God is a loving father to us. And we see that attribute of God and how we should respect that as well. But being hateful to God is probably ungodliness, but it certainly could easily be unrighteous as well. We have this action, and this is a person who's insolent. Let's go back and look at it. This is the word insolent, I-N-S-O-L-E-N-T. This is a person who is very interesting. Our English word hubris comes from it. Now, you hear this you hear this when people talk, and you'll see it in newspapers. I don't hear people use that word very much. But you'll see it in a newspaper, and they'll talk about some nation in their attitude toward another nation. Well, this word comes into our English language. And it's who breeds, though, is the Greek word, an insolent man. Now, look what Thayer says. It lays it out for us. One who, uplifted with pride, either heaps insulting language upon others or does them some shameful act or wrong. I'm just, I just like to hurt you. I just like to hurt people. I'm this kind of person if I'm that way. So if I just enjoy hurting people, I enjoy putting people down, then we would uh, say we're that kind of person. <clears throat> I remember people saying things to other people. We had a boy in school that was very poor when I was in school. And quite frankly, I don't think they took a bath but once a week, okay? And, of course, he, uh, he, he was kind of smelly and dirty. But they were poor as, well, we, we called it poor as church mice is the term we used. And uh, so, but the kids made fun of him and everything. And I just thought, well, he's probably doing the best he can. You ought to leave him alone. And uh, I, just, I just felt that was wrong. And this is that kind of attitude. I'm going to put them down. I'm going to think I'm better than them. You see... Pride's going to lift me up. I'm better than you. And we can get that as far as 
toward other people, the social status, race, or whatever it might be. All of that is the wrong attitude for a Christian. God does not allow it, does not permit it. He does not, he's not pleased with it. So we shouldn't have that kind of attitude. And of course, the next word was haughty. We know what a haughty person is. We used to call them snooty, uh, and they got their nose up in the air. And so I always, I always, we always used to say, his nose up is up in the air so much that if it starts raining, he'll drown. Okay. And so, but you got your nose up in the air. I, I'm haughty if I have uh, my nose up in the air. That's a term that we would use. And so I'm above you. I'm better than you. When we have that attitude, then that's the wrong attitude because it's unrighteous. I don't want you looking down on me so I shouldn't be looking down upon you. Now, see, that's very simple. The golden rule is a very simple test of righteousness. If I don't want it done to me, then I sure shouldn't be doing it to you. And because, you see, righteousness, when I treat everybody by the same standard, and if I think I'm better than you, I'm not treating them by the standard I'm treating myself. I'm treating myself as better. Consequently, I'm not righteous. And so this is uh, the overwinning estimate of one's means or merits. And treating other people with contempt, haughty. Well, I can think I'm the cat's meow, we say, but... Uh, you know, old Marion has his faults too. So we need to be very careful of, of that as God's people. They they had that problem in the patriarchal age. They had a problem in the Mosaic age. We have it today. We all have the problem. It's, it's pride of life when it comes back to it. Boastful people. This is the empty pretender or boaster. And it's one who makes pretense to things high, held in high esteem. You know, <clears throat> I remember watching it on uh, on television, and I, I saw things. People were claiming to have been in uh, the service and served in Vietnam or somewhere like that. And when they te checked them out, they weren't even in the military. And uh, I think that's called stolen valor or something like that. Well, see, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. But it's not just in that area. It's when I pretend to be something that I'm really not. And when I do that, I'm a, I'm, I'm a boaster. I'm a boastful person. And I'm unrighteous. Why? Because I'm elevating myself above you. I'm, I'm taking credit for things I didn't do. That's not righteous. Because we don't want other people doing that. We don't want other people doing that. I get irritated uh, in our language. Everybody that does something good is a hero. Well, it doesn't mean anything anymore now. It doesn't mean anything. Now, to me, a hero is like a guy who way puts his life on the line for somebody else or something like that. Now, these people that are helping and taking care of of uh, like firefighters, and they pull somebody out of a out of a burning building. Yeah, they're heroes. You know, they put their life on the line. But a, a person who just does his job is not. He's doing his job. It's what he's expected to do. I think we can we can steal valor that way. We can just play like we're heroes, or we try to make people into heroes, or maybe even ourselves. You know. <clears throat> So as we look at this then, it says a pretense to, who makes pretense to things held in high esteem even though he does not possess them. That's what he is. That's a boastful person. He's pretending to be something he's not. Greater than he actually has. Now, here's a very interesting term. I find this interesting because it's an inventor of evil things. And so... I contrive evil things. Now, I made a list of evil things that we have invented in the United States. We've invented a new meaning for life. Right? We've invented a new meaning for human life. Well, 
life doesn't begin until you've been born. See? So they can justify abortion. We have invented a new name for marriage. And it, it it's not male and a female anymore. We could go on and on. We've invented a new, na a new name for God. Because... What God does is creates. So organic evolution has created us. And so people have figured out ways to do other things. They've figured out ways to sin. We have new ways to commit old sins. We have television and so forth, pornography and things of that nature. We could go on and on, but we, we, we figured out how to steal money out of people's bank accounts with a computer. See? All of this is inventing new evil things, inventors of, e of evil things. And they'll, they'll figure out more ways to do things. And so I, th I find this to be a, a encompassing term. It, it encompasses the things I just mentioned, many things of that nature, coming up with new things, new ways. We have disobedient to parents. They're disobedient to their parents. Well, that means to not be persuaded. That implies the parents tried to persuade them. You see, if the parents didn't try to persuade them or try to teach them, they're not disobedient to them. <laughs> so the implication is that the parents actually tried to teach them because the word is from the word to be persuaded. It means impersuasible. They refuse to be persuaded. Mom and dad don't know anything. You know, I didn't listen to my dad when I was a teenager. I uh, I thought I wanted to get a suntan. So I'd go out in the field and plow, and I was half a mile from anybody else. So I'd just take my shirt off and get a tan. Well, now I have some had some problems with it. Too much sunlight, not good for you. And I, I didn't wear a hat. I wore a cap. I was a cap guy, but I didn't wear a hat, so I had some I had some skin cancer on those ears. I had to have it taken off two, three, four, five, six years ago. Why? Because I didn't listen to my dad. Uh, he told me, so, so, boys, wear that hat, keep that shirt on, and uh, we just didn't listen to dad. Okay? So... You know, you, you pay the price sometimes. I wouldn't be persuaded by him. And I was wrong. He was right. People are without understanding or unrighteous. So this is people don't have understanding. Why? Because they don't understand. They don't even understand what righteousness is. I'm going to take care of myself. And therefore... I'll just step on you and run over you and because, you know, I'm, I've got the right to it because I'm better than you. But that just fits a whole bunch of things we just said, doesn't it? That kind of attitude. And that's, this, is what, this is up to date. We see this problem among the patriarchal law. We can show it in the law of Moses and, of course, in the New Testament as well. So failure to understand what God has taught is certainly going to be a problem. Today in the United States, if you want to get out of a contract that you've made, just get you a good select lawyer and he'll get you out of it. Now, that's pretty good. That's pretty well true. You get you a good enough lawyer, you can get out of about anything. Well, people who break covenant, covenant breakers are sinful. They're unrighteous. Why? Because when I make a covenant with you, I want you to keep it. But if I'm not willing to keep it, isn't that treating people with a different standard? It's unrighteous. I'm unrighteous when I do that. So right here, a covenant breaker. Now, there's a lot of different covenants we have, but we have covenant breakers of all sorts. Paul used the, uh, the word here, to break covenant, to break faith. And actually it's the, the something that's been placed in position 
and you will not stay with it. You fail to do it. And it's like our word un. The first letter of that Greek word is alpha, and it's equivalent to un. We find it in some English words like atheist, not a theist, agnostic, not, uh, not one who knows, and so forth. Atypical is not typical. So these are Greek words, uh, atypical, amoral, and so forth. All of these are. So right here now, this is he won't stay placed together with. Literally, that's what it means. Don't, you don't keep a covenant. You made it, but you're not going to keep it because it's not to your advantage anymore. See, Paul used this word, a trench tells us, in an active sense to refer to those who are in covenant and treaty with others, but who refuse to abide by these covenants or treaties. You know, we had a situation here in Oklahoma. The Indian tribes had a treaty with the United States. And lo and behold, uh, they just didn't keep them. And now our U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that those tribes have their jurisdiction, their, their reservation didn't cease. It's caused a real problem. But, you know, we made the treaty. The United States did. We need to do what? It's a covenant. We need to what? Keep it. See, I, I understand the problems we're going to have with it. But we made it. And we need to keep our word. We need to be people to keep our word. Our nation needs to keep its word. So I find that to be actually good that the Supreme Court ruled. you got to keep your word. And that's good. That's what they should have said. Now, the troubles we're going to have with it, yes, there are going to be some problems. But it's because we weren't keeping our word that we're having these problems. We don't back up because we got some problems. We keep our word. You know, I, I give my word at something, and lo and behold, I find out that that uh, it's not necessarily a good thing. The children of Israel would go to them now. This is not patriarchal. When they came into the land of Canaan, the Gibeonites came and lied to them, and they made a treaty with them without consulting God. God told them don't make treaties with any of these people. They didn't listen to God. So whenever they found out that these Gibeonites were just not real not very far away and had lied to them, uh, they, uh, they said, well, we've got to keep our word. And God required that they keep their word to the Gibeonites. And when they broke their word later, King Saul did, King Saul died for it. It's very serious. You keep your word. You make the best of your situation. Now, without natural affection is another word. And this word is interesting. There are three, actually four Greek words for love. Three of them are in the Bible, in the New Testament. And agape, phileia, or phileo is the verb, storgos, or storge, and this is ostorgos, it's a negative of it. So this word here is the love I have for family members. So the Greeks had words for love and four different words. Three we find in the New Testament. And this word is a love I have for my family members. It's not wrong to love your children in a different way than you love my children. You're to love my children because you love everybody. But you, you can have that special love for your family and it's not wrong. It's right to do that. It's biblically right, see. If God says it's right, it's right. And even the patriarchal people had to understand that. There's a proper place for your family. And so we have that special situation with them. So it's ruled, and it's found twice in the New Testament, this word. It's a negative form of that kind of love, but failure to have that kind of love is a sin. Now here we have it right here. It is a sin or was a sin under the patriarchal, Romans 1, 31, that we just read. And 2 Timothy 3, 3, it's a sin under the New Testament. Now, we might not be able to find this word being used in the Old Testament, but I think we find the principle clear enough. 
But it really doesn't matter to us. Uh, that is under the law of Moses. We don't find it necessarily this word. But we do find, I believe, the principle. So for us as Christians, we are expected to have a proper love for our family. For my wife, my children, my parents, my grandparents, my aunts, uncles, my children, my grandchildren. I guess I've named about everybody there. But my cousins, okay? And uh, so that's, that's what we have. We have that affection, that special, they're special to us in, in a way. Now, we, we treat them a little bit different because we're supposed to. I have that responsibility for my wife and children and, and to some extent for my grandchildren. Now, we have implacable. That's an interesting word. And you know you have to look it up in the dictionary, implacable. But we think about it here. He won't stay in place. Okay? Implacable. Uh, let's think of the word placate. And we get the word. This is impl implicatable. Implicatable. See, he can't placate them. In other words, you and I get in a fuss, and I just can't make it right with you. No way I can. Then you're implacable. I need to say it the other way as a preacher. I need to say, you and I get in a fuss, and I'm implacable. I won't. I won't. Uh, I won't uh, make it. Let you make it right. You got to lick my boots to get it right. See, that's that's implacable. Right here, the fire tells us it's from a libation, which is kind of sacrifice accompanied by the making of treaties and compacts. So what they did, we go back to Abraham when he made a treaty with Abimelech, and they they sacrificed seven lambs. And the word here was sevens. The word seven was used. And so what we have here is they made a sacrifice. He and Abimelech, the king of that area, and they made this pact, this compact, this covenant. And so right here, Thayer goes on and says, since they took, made a libation, they made a sacrifice when they made a covenant, is without a treaty or covenant. Things not mutually agreed upon, abstinence from hostilities that cannot be persuaded to enter into covenant, implacable. They can't be placated. They won't make peace with you. I, you wronged me, and I will never, ever let it go. That's implacable. That's what we have here. You know, this is kind of relevant to us today, isn't it? We need to be careful we're not that way. I think we should seek peace with all men on God's terms. On God's terms. Right? Be, be sure you put it on God's terms. People who show no mercy, and that is we have unmerciful. No mercy. Merciless. Uh, they don't show mercy to other people. You know, let's think of this in, in this with implacable. It kind of goes right along with it. You know, you wronged me, and I'm I'm not going to ever, 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 no matter what you do, I'm not ever, ever, ever going to let you get away with it. And uh, consequently, I'm going to always get you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to keep keep this matter. I uh, have no mercy. And so mer merciless person, no mercy. That's, of course, sinful under the patriarchal, and we can show it's sinful under the New Testament as well. Now, by implication, he's saying these things are sinful to us because he said they committed these sins, and he goes on in the second chapter of Romans and says, you Jews did the same thing. <laughs> so he's telling us all of these things were unlawful under the law of Moses as well. And we can show... Then he goes on and says, we all need to take care of these matters. And he's talking about us today. So these things we need to be aware of. So right here, people who consent or have pleasure in the when other people do these things. You know, sometimes I think some of our movies get to the point that we're taking pleasure in evil that's done with watching some of the movies. I enjoy good movies, but I sometimes 
some of them can get into situations where we're taking pleasure in sin if we're not careful. So we need to be very careful of that. Who, Mary Alexander reads, knowing the ordinance of God, that they who practice such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, not only those that do them, but those who consent with them that practice them. Now the King James reads differently, have pleasure in these things, have pleasure in them, instead of consent. So the consent is, I have pleasure in it. I'm pleased with, with seeing you do this. You know, I, uh, I'll illustrate this when I was in the first grade. There was this boy that had flunked the, a grade, and he was 21 months older than me, I found out later. And he was in my grade, but he was nearly two years older than me because my birthday was in August. Just had it on last this last week. Yes, I'm 39 again. But uh, what we had is this boy would try to whip me. We got on the school bus. And my older sister told me, she says, Marion, later, she told me those older boys on the back of the bus were, were egging him on to do it. And so he would come and we'd have a fight and he'd just start hitting me and I'd hit back and we'd fight. Then we'd both get the board when we got to school. We got a board, got a whipping. Both of us did. The next day, he'd go after it again. I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't until I got grown up. I was pleased when they moved away. Moved out of the community and moved to Paul's Valley from West Oklahoma. I was tickled to death that they moved away because I didn't have to fight him anymore. But you see, what he do, what these other boys were doing is they were taking pleasure in watching him do what he did. I believe they sinned. And if we take pleasure in that, we sin too. I, I know people that will prod and nudge people to get them to respond and get mad. And there's something wrong with the person that does that. There's something wrong with them. Now, I don't mind teasing, but when you're prodding someone to get them to sin, to get them angry or something like that, you're wrong. That's wrong. You're taking pleasure. This American study reads, consent with it. If I consent with the sin, if I go along with it and say it's okay. Now, the Greek could be interpreted either way. I'm going to say it would be it would apply both ways, and I can prove it from other scripture. Okay? But let's look further. Since the Gentiles were guilty of coveting back in verse 29, God must have revealed this to them at some time. Let me show you why. In Romans 1, 29, being filled of all unrighteousness, wickedness, covetousness. There, there it is, covetousness. Maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malignity, whispers. Now let's look. In Exodus 20, verse 17, then the, what's called the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, we find here, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor thy manserv his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is his, thy neighbor's. And he lays them all out. Now, other verses later elaborate on this even more detail. But right here, he lays out some things you're not to covet. But now, you say, well, didn't they know not to covet? No, they didn't, not till this time. Because coveting is a, is a sin of the heart. It's a sin of the mind. In Romans 7 and verse 7, Paul, in looking back, and this is a hard passage to interpret, Romans 7. But in Romans 7, I'm convinced that what it's saying here is that Paul is saying that a Jew, he is, he is personating, he is putting himself in the place of a Jew when they came out of Egypt and the law of Moses was given. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Howbeit I have not known sin except the Lord said, except through the law, for I had not known coveting. Now he's going to illustrate with coveting, except the Lord said, thou shalt not covet. In other words, they did not know coveting was a sin until the law of Moses revealed it. And these people were living under the patriarchal law. But we see over here in Romans 1, 20, uh, 29, that the patriarchal law knew that coveting was a sin. It was a sin for them. So I would, I would argue here since under the patriarchal, they didn't know it was a sin until 
Decalogue was given, Mount Sinai, Ten Commandments, to the Law of Moses was given, that at that time God must have revealed it was a sin to other people under the patriarchal law at that time or, or after that time. I would argue probably the same time. So he revealed it. So they didn't know that it was a sin until the law said, Thou shalt not covet. Now they understood, can't murder and do these other sins, lie and steal and so forth. But they didn't understand about the heart. You know, I hear people today will say that, you know, and they'll mention, well, just thinking it doesn't hurt. Yes, it does. Thinking it does. Because that's that's coveting. That's a sin, see. My heart can sin. I can sin with my thoughts as well as with my words and actions. Romans 13, 9 lays it out clearly again in the, chapter, in the book of Romans. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. It's Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandments, it's summed up in this word, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. In other words, coveting is not love. And we hear all this about love, but if I covet what the other person has, I don't love that person. So coveting is a lack of love. In fact, these other commandments are a lack of love too. He said, it's summed up, don't do these things, that's love, if you don't do these things. Love demands that I not murder anybody. Isn't that, isn't that pretty clear? Love demands that I not steal from you. Love demands that I not even covet what you have. And uh, other commandments of the law. Those are all acts of love, in particular. The law, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, was lumped into two categories. I think there were four commandments that related to our relationship to God. The other six related to our relationship to our fellow man. And certainly love for fellow man would cause me to treat him right. I won't steal from him. I won't lie about him. I won't cheat him. I won't murder him and so forth. I won't covet what he has. Now, my love for God, I'm going to treat God the, right, the way God ought to be treated. He deserves to be. Therefore, he must, that is, he, God, must have revealed it to the Gentiles at some time, perhaps at or near the same time. Most moral principles are timeless. Uh, we're going to have a slide here. Murder, stealing, lying, and so forth are wrong and always have been wrong. They're wrong under the patriarchal law, under the mosaic, and long under the wrong under the New Testament as well. Loving God and loving one's neighbor has always been good under all three dispensations. The nature of God is timeless. So whatever the Bible says about God under the patriarchal, like in the book of Job, it's a patriarchal book, we know that's the nature of God. God is timeless. He is immutable. He doesn't change. So when we read about the nature of God, so we can take the Old Testament and much of it applies to us because it's timeless principles. See, that's why we can preach from it. That's why we preach from it. Now, what we have here, we have these three dispensations. We have the blue circle, the patriarchal, the red, the mosaic, and the green is the Christian. What we have then is that in that area where all three circles overlap, that little it looks like a triangle, but the sides of it are curved, right where the arrow is pointing. That right there is where all three of these laws come together, and they all have the same law. In other words, I would put in that there, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt not lie, bear false witness, and so forth. These are the things that will be in that category. And so when I read in the Old Testament, and we're going to do this, Thou shalt not murder. We find we find that it's defined for us. We're going to go through it in the next week or two to show what it is. So I would I would argue then that this is very useful to us because now we can see how to use our Bible to learn from it. Because people ask me from time to time, why do you preach from the Old Testament? We're not under the Old Testament. Yes, we are. Parts of it are universal timeless principles and we preach those principles and so we do that that's why we do it even though we're not under the old testament any part of the scriptures can be used to define a timeless principle anytime it's discussed 
Therefore, however, the patriarchal or mosaic law define a timeless principle applies to the New Testament as well. This is why we can use the Old Testament for some matters and cannot use it for other matters. Principles that are not timeless, we don't use it for. The following lesson, we're going to elaborate on this more fully. Let me summarize it. The lesson will be yours. When we are righteous, we treat everyone by the same standard. We use the golden rule. That's the, that, that's the rule Christians ought to be following every day. Many sins are under classification of unrighteousness, and some are under classification of ungodliness. Some are both ungodly and unrighteous. They sin by taking pleasure in the sins of other people. We do too. So we shouldn't be pleased when other people sin. The next lesson is going to deal with timeless principles, and if the Lord willing, the next week. The lesson is yours. I hope it's been useful to you. As we've studied this, we haven't laid out the plan of salvation, but the scriptures teach that we must begin by faith, Hebrews 11, 6. Faith comes out of God's word, Romans 10, 17. And then we must repent of our sins. We must decide we're going to quit sinning. That's Acts 17, 30. Then we must make a confession, Romans 10, 9 and 10. That's an oath or a vow. Uh, that we're going to make Jesus our Lord, and we believe in the Christ, Son of God, then we're baptized for remission of sins, Acts 2.38. We arise, Romans 6, 3, and 4, to live differently. So we're going to live differently in our lives. If you're subject, we're going to sing an invitation song at this time. We're not coming as we stand and sing.